Hi, I'm just wondering, did you make anything today? Yes, no? Are you, is there any makers among you? A few? Yes, okay. Great, okay, I'm, I'm a big maker. So, um, yeah, I, um, I'm talking today about several um, issues and um, I'm wondering, some of you who don't maybe make that much, um, that you learn something, that I'm inspiring you, and people that are makers, they understand a lot of that flow, that you know, sense of total immersion that you get when you have that connection of that ultimate physical reality. Because right now, everything we do in our lives is more or less intermediate. And most people actually, they cannot remember when they made something tangible that existed because of them. And I think that this is about to change majorly. So my name is Nora Abustet, and I believe that we are what we make. And I recently started a company called Colabra that brings that belief and practice into the world. And today I want to convince you of three things. And this is where uh, Sabrina was talking about the provocative thing. Um, I think making is the new sex. And um, it's just that when you're making, it's just like sex, that's a very holistic, attention-consuming, and defragmenting experience, and it's actually a rarity in the world, when you're in that zone and you're just focusing on this one thing, and the makers among you know what I'm talking about. Uh, my second statement is that I think that making can save the economies of the West, and it's because we're regaining skills to make things and technology actually brings some of the efficiency gains of the China price to the ordinary household consumer. So we will become more innovative and we can get manufacturing back pretty much one kitchen table at a time. Yeah, and I also think that the future of the internet is offline. It's not, the future of the internet is not the internet itself. People are going online to learn something to get back offline and to do things with the physical world. And I want to show you why I'm such a big fan of making, why I'm spreading it, why I hope it's going to be inspiring, um, and why it matters so much in the next slides. So this is a picture of me in a soapbox uh, race car that I made with some friends. You can see the wheels of my bicycle. And this is not decades ago, this is actually just a few years ago. And uh, yeah, I mean, many people, they just stimulate their minds with maybe uh, Pinot Noir, beer, pot, cocaine, whatever, I don't know. Um, but those of you who make, you know that there's actually no more scintillating drug than making something. And um, you understand that once you made something, there's the sense of accomplishment. And I'm saying it twice, sense of accomplishment. It's something you accomplish something and that gives you physical pleasure. And um, right now we live pretty much in a fragmented age and a lot of people of you are doing many things at once right now. I can see somebody on this computer and there was somebody on their phone, which is okay, no problem. Maybe you're tweeting about this talk. Um, but the thing is that making, and why I'm so passionate about it, it's really one of the rare opportunities to be singular and to defragment your brain. It's very meditative. Making is also about generosity. So that's a beautiful virtue, right? Um, where skills used to be passed on from generation to generation. And the parent teaches the child, the child gets a sweater, the parent gives a gift, and both create this bond. So making might not be the oldest profession of the world, but it's, <laughs> yes, <laughs> pun intended, um, but it's certainly the oldest open source movement. And I know you, being a maker, you understand what that means. Um, and a lot of people think of crafting as something that's maybe a bit dusty. Maybe your grandmother has done it, um, wearing curlers on her green velvet sofa or something. But um, making is actually quite subversive, subversive and can keep you sane. And you right now, what you see here is a cross-stitch sampler that was exhibited for four years in four German concentration camps. And Major Alex Castagli, who was a um, prisoner of war, he used thread from an old sweater 
to cross-stitch this on the canvas. And if you take a closer look, you can see some dots and some lines. Does anybody know Morse code in here? No one? Really? Oh, there's one person. You forgot. No problem. Today I'll teach you. Not the whole thing, but I'll definitely help you to read it. So um, when you see, you see this um, kind of like these red things, and then there's the, the sickle and the swastika, and in the middle there's a frame with like dots, and like on, in the frame there's these dots. Can you see that? Okay, good. Um, so basically what that says is, um, God save the king, fuck Hitler. And I just told you, right, it was exhibited for four years in the concentration camps. So that's pretty brave. And I'm sure he was uh, um, smiling or chuckling um, quite a bit. So it was actually a tradition amongst British soldiers to do crafts. It was called trench art. Like, you know, trenches when they, when they hide from the um, cannons or whatever they use in war. Um, and so he also taught 40 other soldiers. And the British Red Cross actually taught soldiers to cross-stitch and to quilt to overcome war traumas. So making is also about practice, patience, learning, and mastery. And some of you might have heard about the famous scientist K. Anders Ericsson. Yes, no? 10,000 hours, have you heard about that theory? Yes, okay, so it takes 10,000 hours of practice before any individual can become an expert, that's what he said. You can try it, start now, so we get there. And uh, this is a Norman Rockwell painting, and I think that somehow shows beautifully um, about, it, it, it somehow shows you this sense of patience and practice. And um, any kind of person that makes, that knits, that sews for hours, you first know that it's a bit frustrating, and then it becomes highly pleasurable. And it's a big reward, actually. Uh, making is also an active way of thinking, which leads to innovation. When experts face problems, the experimenting, experimenting, which is actually a form of making, unfolds new possibilities. And I sometimes think that in our age of networking and connections and getting to know this person and jumping to this party and event, I don't know what, that making is a really nice reminder um, that an old-fashioned way can be successful. Because knowing people doesn't really help you to make a desk, right? So, um, yeah, making is another kind of um, mental activity. And I, I think that if you don't know how to make something, it's almost like you don't know how to read. And we call people who don't know how to read, we call them illiterate. And I think we should put the same weight on making. And we shouldn't graduate kids that can't read. I think it's completely irresponsible to do that. Anyway, um, to move on, I would like to um, shed a quick light on two passionate makers who you all know because they created um, a company that's now pretty much the biggest in the world. And I just heard backstage um, they were, you know, they were mentioned as well. So um, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, um, they started tinkering on computers in the Palo Alto homebrew computer club, so they were hobbyists, right? And they had an interest in computing. They actually wanted to make computers. They also wanted to impress their fellow members. But my argument here is that Apple, which is now a multi-billion dollar company with the world's largest market cap of over $500 billion, bigger than Exxon, bigger than oil, right? Um, was not started by academics and people with PhDs, but by people passionate about passionate about making stuff. So I think this is very powerful. And going forward, I find that especially powerful or meaningful um, when you put the two elements together. First of all, there's a maker renaissance. I've lived five years in the US and I witnessed something very inspiring. We, we were just talked about the hacker spaces. And you look, you see my maker, uh, maker Fair, right? I don't know if you've been to one of the first ones, but they really grew exponentially. And when you see what's going on on the web, so number one, there's a maker renaissance. And number two, um, this community is, with the help of the web, becoming very social. And when you look at what social can do to things, you know, what's this? This is Web 1.0. It was all about consuming and reading. And most of you, maybe some of you, I don't know, but you remember when it became, well, it's not that long ago, but you remember when it became social. This is what happened. It exploded, right? And this is exactly what's going on and what's, increasing dramatically in the maker culture. The maker culture is 
has become social and is on its brink to explode and it's going to radically change the way we consume or won't consume anymore. So we go offline now, uh, we go online to be offline, right? Online, we're organizing activities around um, physical goods. So we go online to around activities around physical goods. I'm just giving you some examples. You know, there's Skillshare. I just taught a course how to learn how to knit. I'm going to teach another one if you're interested. Um, anyway, so um, that's a beautiful example of that too. Um, YouTube, where ordinary people can make anything. Um, and I mean, for lack of a better word, but the web really is democratizing the knowledge of how to make stuff. And you all have access. And I'm just giving YouTube as an example because one of the high search terms are how to make something, right? Like that's, that's what a lot of people build businesses around that because people look for that so much. Um, so we're at Maker Faire and you all know, you're all makers so you understand what I mean. But we're currently disabled or the majority is disabled because outsourcing has made us forgot many things. And when you look at the um, pre industrial world, right? In the physical world, we started with making. In fact, we made everything. The house was the center of production. We would milk the cow, make the cheese, spin the wool, knit the underwear. I remember my mother even in the 40s and 50s, she always told me how her grandmother used to knit her underwear and it was so itchy. Anyway, um, now it's Calvin Klein, right? And so um, following the Industrial Revolution, a major shift, social shift occurred in the conception of the house. We've passed over a century of pure consumption. And first the factories made stuff, and then these factories all moved abroad, right? So over time, unemployment rose dramatically. And first we were out of work, and then we lost our ability to make things. And right now we actually depend on other people to make things. And I think that's quite disturbing. Imagine you had to depend on other people talking to others. So it's almost as if there was a technology invented that replaced your speaking, right? Imagine you wire your brain to China and they speak for you. Um, it's great efficiency, but you lose the ability to speak. And I hope you understand when I give you these analogies. It's serious. Um, so we've outsourced making. We've lost the capacity and our making muscles have atrophied. But guess what? I'm of course, I'm an optimist, so I'm here to bring the good news. Just like the web became participatory, there's a similar transition in the physical world. Consumers are already prosumers and now they're becoming makers. And this is probably something that you guys all know, you know, it's the new maker bot, looks pretty nice. Um, you know, you have 3D printing, shape ways, they're now printing glass, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, you have things like Instructables, which has been around for a long time, but sold to Autodesk, they have a booth here too. Um, you know, Etsy, some people make things, they're selling, they actually make a living, literally they're making a living. And of course there's Maker Fair, and I think that Maker Fair started with a few 10, 20,000 visitors and now it's up to 80, 90, 100. I don't know what's the latest number. I'm sure they, they crossed 100,000 on one weekend. That's amazing. Um, there's Burda Style, a sewing community that I started before I started Colabra, which has now 800,000 members, just around one brand, one product, patterns, making things. You have Ravelry, which has 2 million members. Fashion is going into DIY, um, you know, where big brands are associating with how things were made, making something theory, Bennett, and they're all getting into this teaching, having knitting classes in their stores. Um, honestly, WTF, one of these fashion DIY sites, they have a little blog actually, they're, I mean little, 760,000 uniques every month. So in the beginning, people were making things at home. Then there was the industrial revolution in China happened. But now, as I said, you know, the household is coming back, but there's a new model of that household, that center of production. You have people watching YouTube, asking questions in different forums, and maybe selling something at Etsy. Um, this is my world. This is Collabra. This is the company I started. And we teach people how to learn to knit, to sew, to make jewelry. We're going next year into woodworking, electronics. We match projects with supplies and techniques 
and you can basically we ship you what you need to make something. So we hope that you can get inspired and then make your own things. Um, yeah, this is how the marketplace looks like. So making or craft knowledge has always been passed on from person to person, and it was rather a linear, slow process. And through the web now, it can multiply, and the knowledge of how to make something can really spread uh, like light speed. And so sites in their networks empower and enable more people to make things, and more people will. And they will feel that sense of accomplishment, learn patience, and acquire new skills and mastery, and they actually will find happiness and sanity. And it will create new jobs, ultimately. And it's, it's, it's deeply satisfying. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I started making something when I was very young. When I was 12, I made my first money sewing hairbands and selling them at school. And 20 years later, this became handy. And um, that's when I started this company. Um, I believe we are what we make. And I think there's going to be good, great changes coming around the world, in the world, the way we live in this world. And um, yeah, this is just my message. And this is what I hope to spread. Thank you. Thank you.